whooping cough is a serious infection that can cause a distressing cough, difficulty breathing, difficulties with feeding and vomiting. Whooping cough vaccine is one of the routine baby vaccines every child is given, so babies aged six months and older are usually protected against whooping cough. However, infants less than eight weeks old who are too young to have had their vaccines are especially vulnerable to this infection. Whooping cough may cause serious complications, especially in these very young babies. who may have to be hospitalised because of difficulty with breathing or with feeding. Young infants who are unvaccinated, that means children under two months of age who have not received a two month vaccine, are a very susceptible group for whooping cough infection. These infants can be protected through pertussis vaccination during pregnancy and that's the only way these infants can be protected. When they get this condition, they get excessive coughing, they need oxygen, they often go blue or dusty, they have feeding difficulties and unfortunately they are prone to complications from the whooping cough infection. These complications can include pneumonia, some procedures and potentially brain injury. Unfortunately, there have been children, especially young infants in Ireland, who have died because of whooping cough in the last number of years. This is a preventable infection, and especially important for this vulnerable group, I encourage all pregnant women to receive the pertussis vaccine during pregnancy. It's been shown to be a safe, effective vaccine, and it's the only way you can protect your vulnerable infants. The reason why this vaccination schedule was started in pregnancy is that there was an increased number of babies um, being affected with the whooping cough scare. It's the same vaccine that you give to your children, so it's nothing different. And the whole aim of it is that it will boost your immune system as a whole, and it will give you the opportunity to pass that immunity across to your baby, across the placenta. There is this increasing uh, recognition of the importance of this vaccine. Um, and our focus today is just to try and encourage all moms to go and have their vaccine done. Not for their own protection, but for the protection of their baby when it's born. Whooping cough vaccine or pertussis is an important vaccine in, in, in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It's a safe vaccine in pregnancy. There's no risk to the pregnancy itself. It can be given any time uh, from uh, 16 to 18 weeks onwards in, in pregnancy. Well, some women do worry about what effects it might have on them directly themselves. Like any vaccine, when you get it, you could have a, an area of soreness around the injection site, sometimes a little bit of redness around that site, which is very short-lived and is of no harm to them or their baby. My name is Dr. Mel Yunus and I will support you if you're experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Fiona and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Valerie and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Margaret and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Sarah and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Dr. Nass and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Louise and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Anne-Marie and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Margaret and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Orla and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Emmett and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. 
Hello, my name is Brida and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Veronica and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is John Higgins. I'm the Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology and the Clinical Director for the Ireland South Women and Infants Directorate. We will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. We are West Cork Women Against Violence and we're here to support you if you're experiencing any form of domestic violence. My name is Margo and I work in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit and I'm here to support you if you're experiencing sexual violence. My name is Sinead and I work in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit and I'm here to support you if you're experiencing domestic or sexual violence. Louise and I work in the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit and I'm here to support you if you experience domestic or sexual violence. Hi, my name is Deborah and I and my colleagues Mary and Angela will help you and support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. Hello, my name is Jennifer and I work with Coonley Refuge and I will support you if you are experiencing domestic violence. My name is Mary Crowley. If you have experienced any form of sexual or domestic violence and need counselling or support, please contact us. Hello, I'm Carol. I'm with Manafasa and I'm here to help you. Hi, my name is Ruth and I work for Yana Domestic Violence Project in North and East Cork and we're here to support you if you're experiencing domestic violence. We need air to breathe. We must breathe in order to stay alive. Our lungs transport the oxygen that we inhale when breathing into our blood cells. This blood is then carried to the heart. The heart works as a pump for the body, 
transporting the oxygen to all other organs. When we smoke, we are filling our lungs with over 7,000 chemicals, including nicotine, the addictive substance which fools the brain into feeling happy for several minutes. It's a deadly poison in high doses. Tar, the ingredient which stains the teeth and fingers. It gathers as a sticky brown substance in the lungs. Carbon monoxide, a poisonous gas which lowers the blood's ability to transport oxygen. Formaldehyde, radioactive chemicals. Toxic metals, which are used in the making of batteries, paint, pesticides and steel. And poisonous gases, which may be used in the making of lighter fluid, household cleaners and even chemical weapons. These chemicals are transported to tissues all around the body when we smoke. Smoking increases the risk of cardiovascular diseases such as heart attack, stroke and angina. And respiratory diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Smoking also raises blood pressure, stains skin and teeth and can even contribute to fertility problems. Smoking can be harmful to your baby while pregnant. Lung cancer is the most common cancer caused by smoking. One in five heavy smokers will die of lung cancer. Smoking 10 cigarettes or more a day qualifies as heavy smoking. Smoking can also result in cancers of the throat, larynx, nose, mouth, bladder, esophagus and pancreas. As well as causing long-term diseases, smoking also weakens the immune system, meaning it's easier to catch diseases and takes longer to recover from everyday illnesses. Smokers will spend on average two extra days in hospital per visit than non-smokers. All in all, smokers lose an average of 10 to 15 quality years of life. 85% of the smoke from a cigarette is consumed by others. The children of smokers have higher rates of admission to hospital and spend an average of three extra days per visit in hospital compared to the children of non-smokers. Children are also more at risk of sudden infant death syndrome, respiratory diseases such as asthma and bronchitis and ear infections. Giving up smoking saves your life. Within 20 minutes of quitting, blood pressure drops and pulse rate and body temperature return to normal. Within 48 hours of quitting, the ability to taste and smell improves. And within three weeks, lung function and circulation improves. After one year of not smoking, the risk of sudden death from heart attack is almost cut in half. Smoking is also an expensive habit. Quitting could save you thousands per year. Smoking 10 cigarettes a day costs 1,825 euro per year. Cork University Hospital is a smoke-free campus and is committed to helping you stop smoking. Smoking cessation officers are available to advise and support you. Willpower is no match for addiction. Studies have shown you are more likely to quit using a smoking cessation product. Smoking cessation products include Nicotine Replacement Therapy, NRT. Examples include a patch, gum or inhaler. Alternatives including tablets like Shampix. Please note that most of these therapies to be effective need a minimum of 12 weeks treatment. The HSE advocates the use of dual NRT, such as a patch and inhaler combination, as the recommended first time treatment. Your smoking cessation officer can advise you on all of these options. Quitting is four times more likely to be successful when the individual receives support. If you have any questions about nicotine replacement therapy at CUH, please contact the smoking cessation officer at 021 4922 280 or 087 121 9633.
Gestational diabetes is one of the most common health problems that can happen during pregnancy. It affects as many as 12% of pregnancies in Ireland and can lead to serious problems for both mum and baby. Certain women are at higher risk of developing gestational diabetes. For example, if you are overweight, if you have a family member with diabetes, if you had gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy or depending on your ethnic background. If you are at risk, you will receive a blood test for gestational diabetes between 24 and 28 weeks of pregnancy. If you are diagnosed, there are day-to-day -day changes you can make to stay healthy. How much exercise you get and what kind of food you eat can have important effects on your health and your baby's health. But what happens when you have gestational diabetes and how can diet and exercise help? Food and drinks are broken down in your digestive system. The sugar they contain is absorbed into your bloodstream. But sugar needs insulin to work. Insulin is made by the pancreas and helps sugar get into your cells. Insulin acts like a key that lets the sugar move from the bloodstream into the cells of your body where it is used for energy. Pregnancy hormones change the way insulin works in your body. In the later stages of pregnancy, these changes make it difficult for insulin to unlock the cells and allow the sugar to enter. This is what is known as insulin resistance. Some insulin resistance is normal in pregnancy, but this means that your pancreas needs to work extra hard to keep blood sugar levels in a healthy range. When you have gestational diabetes, your pancreas is not able to keep up. As a result, too much sugar is left in the blood. However, a carefully planned diet with high fibre carbohydrates and no added sugar can make it easier for your body to manage the sugar in your blood. Exercise will also help keep blood sugar low as it improves insulin's ability to unlock the cells and uses up sugar for energy. If blood sugar is controlled, your chances of a healthy pregnancy are the same as a non-diabetic mum. This makes diet and exercise powerful tools for a healthy pregnancy. However, if blood sugar is not well controlled, this can lead to problems in both mum and baby. In a study of 23,000 pregnant women around the world, researchers found a link between high blood sugar in mum and babies that had grown too big. Researchers also found a link between high blood sugar and preeclampsia, premature delivery, need for caesarean section, birth injury and abnormal sugar control in baby. Diabetes during pregnancy can also put you and your baby at risk for problems later in life, including type 2 diabetes and heart disease. But there are actions you can take. Changes in diet and exercise, combined with close monitoring, can successfully manage blood sugar in 7 out of 10 pregnancies. So no better time to start than now. To learn more about Irish research on maternal and newborn health, you can visit the HRB Mother and Baby Clinical Trial Network's website.
I'd like to discuss with you your pain relief options that are available to you once you're admitted to hospital. Your midwife will meet you and discuss your birth preferences and assess your stage of labour. This will help determine what type of pain relief is most appropriate for you at this time. Firstly, I'd like to talk to you about pethidine. So pethidine is an opiate similar to morphine and it's given by injection into your thigh. It can make you feel a little bit nauseous, so we would always give you an anti-emetic or an anti-sickness injection at the same time. It's very helpful in the early stages of your labor and it can relieve a lot of the intensity in your contractions. It can make some mums feel a little bit drowsy, but sometimes this can be just enough to allow you to rest and relax between the contractions and allow your labor to continue throughout. Pethidine can also make your baby a little bit sleepy. And so for this reason, we would be reluctant to give you pethidine if we felt that your baby's arrival was imminent. To determine this, sometimes we can assess you prior to administering the drug, just to be sure. Here in the CUMH, we have gas and air available in all of our birthing rooms. Also known as Entinox, it's a mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen. It's a short acting drug and it has no effect on your baby. And it is perfectly safe to take this if you've already had some pethidine. The drug itself is self-administered through a mouthpiece and tubing, and it takes just a few seconds to take effect. Your midwife will encourage you to take a deep breath through the mouthpiece at the start of your contraction, and then exhale slowly. You continue to breathe like this until the pain has passed. One of the advantages of using gas and air in your labor is the technique is the same as you would have used in your breathing techniques for the earlier part of your labor. The tubing for the gas and air is long, so you'll still be able to mobilize around the room. You'll be able to use your birthing ball, change positions, and generally mobilize to where you find yourself most comfortable. Gas and air is also available in the birthing pool. An epidural is another form of pain relief that is also available to you here in our birthing suite. This is a procedure that's performed by an anaesthetist. And should you decide to have an epidural, the anaesthetist will come and explain and discuss this procedure with you prior to commencing it. An epidural is where a small tube is inserted into the small of your back. Through this tube, a local anaesthetic is inserted by the anaesthetist, and this local anaesthetic numbs the nerves that carry the signals to the part of the body that feels pain. Most women will find that an epidural is a very effective form of pain relief in their labor. However, it does make changing position very difficult in labor, and it is not possible to mobilize any further. Throughout the rest of your labor, you will require to have a continuous monitoring of the baby because there's a continuous infusion and observations will need to be carried out. A urinary catheter will be inserted and IV fluids will be required also. An epidural will mean that you are confined to your bed for a good six hours after your baby is born. It is important to remember though that in any of your choices regarding your pain relief, your midwife is there to support you and help you make the appropriate decision. Here in Cork University Maternity Hospital, we also have a birthing pool. At present, we do not conduct water births and request that you would exit the pool prior to your baby's birth. Water immersion has been found to be very useful in managing pain in labor. The warm water helps to relax the muscles between contractions and also the water supports and makes moving and changing posi position much easier. There is evidence to suggest that the use of water in labour leads to shorter labours. However, your midwife would not recommend the use of the pool if you have had a pethidine injection in the preceding four hours. However, gas and air is available. The pool is available for all women that are experiencing a low-risk pregnancy um, and your midwife will assess your suitability for the pool prior to entering it.
becoming a parent uh, can bring lots of exciting moments and challenges at the same time. Getting to know your baby is very important. It does take time and adjusting to parenthood can also take quite a bit of time. But I'm going to go through today some tips and helpful hints that may help you in your transition into parenthood. Getting to know your baby is very important and your baby will be the best teacher that you will ever have. Um, being a responsive parent means responding to your baby's needs. By holding your baby close, you can show them signs of comfort and make them feel secure. Your baby is too young for a routine. Uh, they do not know the difference between day and night um, and they will wake often for feeds. Babies have small stomachs and they feed little and often in the early days. It is normal for your baby to feed several times during the night. As they grow, they'll sleep longer and feed less night at night time. Be tuned into your baby's body language. Your baby will often show you signs and signals. For example, your baby will let you know that they're tired if they rub their eyes, if they yawn, or if they simply turn away. You will start to recognize these signs over time. Communicating through crying is one way in which your baby can tell you what they're looking for. Remember, babies will have different cries for different things. And I can assure you that in a few weeks time, you will be the best person to tell you what your baby is looking for. You will be able to distinguish those cries and you will know the difference between each one of them. Remember as well, you are not spoiling your baby by responding to their needs. They want to feel secure and safe in the first few weeks. And that is how you do it, is by listening to them and learning from them. Your baby's needs are simple. They don't want uh, fancy toys or fancy clothes. They want simple things like warmth, food, comfort, security and love. Remember, you have the skills to do it. Your baby will teach you everything you need to know. So just be responsive to their needs. Nature has been researching your milk for hundreds of millions of years. The composition of your milk is alive and changes throughout the day, the night, the months and the years 
to meet your child's needs. Your milk contains stem cells. These are cells that create and repair the body and are being researched worldwide to cure conditions like Alzheimer's and diabetes. Your milk contains components that kill cancerous cells. Your body identifies bacteria and viruses found in your baby's body and environment. You then produce antibodies specifically tailored to those infections and deliver them to your child through your milk. Your milk appears to switch on a gene in your baby's body which produces a hormone called leptin. This hormone tells your baby when his tummy is full, protecting him against overeating. Your milk contains oxytocin, a hormone that induces relaxation and feelings of well-being in your child and in you. It's all in you. Human milk, tailor-made for tiny humans. Changing your newborn's nappy is one of those things you'll be doing seven or eight times a day, so it's best to be organised from the start. Make sure you have everything you need ready and close to hand. Place your baby on a clean, soft, flat surface. Open the nappy and wipe away excess stools from the genital area with the corner of the nappy. Hold your baby by the ankles and lift up their bottom. Use soft cotton balls or a wet cloth to clean your baby. Clean around the umbilical cord area. For a girl, be sure to wipe from front to back. This will help minimise the spread of an infection. Swap a clean nappy for the dirty one. Use the tabs to see which way goes up. Avoid covering the umbilical cord as this can cause irritation. For a boy, keep his penis pointed down. Fasten the nappy at both sides with the tapes, making sure it's snug, but not so tight that it pinches the skin. Retape the soiled nappy around the contents, put it in a plastic bag and discard it in the bin. Dress your baby and wash your hands thoroughly. Babies wet their nappies several times a day. The number of wet nappies is a helpful sign of how much fluid the baby is taking in. Generally a baby should have five to six wet nappies each day. This is a good indication that they're getting enough milk.
babies are always to be placed on their back when they sleep, whether it be day or night. The safest, it is the safest position for your baby because it reduces the risk of sudden infant death syndrome um, and also suffocation. The safest place for your baby to sleep is in your room in their own cot for the first six months. I'm now going to demonstrate the positions of which you should put your baby in safely to sleep. Baby should always be placed into the cot with their feet to the foot of the cot. And the reason for this is it will stop your baby preventing them from wriggling underneath the blankets. So what we recommend is that the baby's feet are to the foot of the cot so they have nowhere else to go. Um, so it could be the cot, it could be the Moses basket, it could be the crib, it's whatever place your baby is sleeping. So feet to the bottom, blankets then should be tucked loosely across at shoulder level. The other thing we do recommend is that if you can use the cellular blankets. So the cellular blankets are the ones with the holes in them and they're aerated so that more air can go down through it and help your baby's temperature to be maintained and cool themselves down if they do get too hot. Another thing to remember is that there shouldn't be anything else in the cot. So no fluffy toys, nothing that can cause suffocation risk, so no uh, bumper pads, toys, um, or any extra garments in the cot. Your baby's head should always remain uncovered because again, if your baby gets too hot, they can lose some of their temperature out through the top of their head and that helps to prevent them from overheating. If you do decide to use a sleeping bag, um, make sure that the sleeping bag is the correct size for your baby. So for this baby, we'd be using a small newborn sleeping bag. You'd have a low tog quality and you'd ensure that the bag had no, sleeping bag had no hood. Something similar to this, um, where their sleeping bag would fit the baby's size, that their arms could be out freely, and that it's a low tug quality. We don't recommend co-sleeping with your baby, as uh, there is an increased risk that the baby may overheat. Sometimes as well, you may roll over onto your baby and there's an increased risk of suffocation. It is important not to sleep with your baby in the bed. If you are a smoker, if you've taken alcohol, if you've taken any drugs, be there illegal or illegal drug use, anything that would make you drowsy, or if you're extremely overtired. We also recommend that you do not sleep with your baby in the bed if they are less than three months old, if they were born at 30, before 37 weeks, or if they let, weighed less than 2.5 kgs. Cot death doesn't automatically happen in a cot. It can also happen in a bed, a pram, or a car seat. Um, it is important to maintain the safe sleep positions no matter where your baby sleeps. So always remember to keep your baby on their back. But never leave your baby um, unsupervised in a sitting position such as car seats, um, bouncers, or anything similar like that. We don't recommend that the baby is left sleeping in those unsupervised. So normally the room temperature should be anything between 16 to 20 degrees. And so ju you judge it by yourself. If you're comfortable in your room environment, the baby should be comfortable as well too. Um, use the cellular blankets, as I said, feet to the foot of the cot, blankets loosely across the shoulder, level, nothing covering the baby's head, and if your baby seems unwell, seek medical attention. You put your cold water in first, you add your hot, you just check it with your elbow. If it's comfortable for your elbow, it's fine for the baby. It's about 36 degrees centigrade, the water temperature. You put your hand underneath the baby's head like that. You just took the baby under your elbow resting on your hip. Now, I'm holding the baby in the same position and I'm going to wash the baby's hair. So just wash it nice and gently. 
This is a very good baby. And I'm going to come back onto my mat. And I'm going to lie the baby back down and I'm going to dry the baby's head well. Babies lose a lot of heat from their heads, so make sure that you dry the baby's head very well. Now, when you're lifting the baby into the bath, just turn the baby over on its side, over in this position. Just put one arm, your left arm, underneath the head and hold on to the left arm. And put your right arm underneath the bottom and hold on to the left leg. Now you see there is no way this baby's going to fall on me. I've got the head well supported with my arm here on the left and I've got a good grip of the baby. Now nice and gently you're going to let the baby into the bath. If the baby's enjoying it, of course, just leave them in for a little while. Babies are very used to water from being inside, so they love the sound of the water. I'm going to lift the baby out again. Now you see I'm lifting the baby out nice and gently. So you settle them down, give them a little cuddle. Settle them down and then you're going to dry the baby off well. Don't forget areas where they can get sore if you leave them wet. All babies are quite fat in here, so get right in there under the chin because if you leave areas wet, they're going to get red and sore. They are all get right onto the armpit here where they're all they're like that. And another area is get right onto the behind the knees and in the groin area. They're areas that can actually get sore if you leave them wet. So you make sure that you dry those areas off very well.